going to make me cry. That was not planned at all. How are we doing this morning, Lincoln Heights? Good. <laughs> Man, they messed around and gave the intern the mic, so we'll see how this goes. But like Pastor Rusin said, my name is J.C. Krupa, and I'm the pastoral intern here at Lincoln Heights Christian Church, and I am ecstatic to be sharing God's word with you today. Uh, just before we dive into the message today, I just wanted to thank you guys. I have been at Lincoln Heights about a year now, about 10, 11 months, and when I got to Lincoln Heights, spiritually, I was in a very dark and broken place. Uh, and it was through Pastor Rusin, it was through the elder board, it was through uh, the staff that are people that I consider friends and not just my coworkers that I was able to rediscover my purpose and my love for ministry and my love for Jesus and people. And I love this church, I love you guys, and I hope to be here serving for a very long time. So thank you guys so much. Why don't you give yourself a round of applause today? So we are continuing our uh, Repair and Restore series. We've been going through the book of Nehemiah. So if you got your Bibles with you today, turn to Nehemiah chapter 13. If you're living in the 21st century and you want to grab your phone and go to that Bible app or follow along on the screen, that's good as well. Uh, we're going to be going through the first nine verses of the 13th chapter. And today's message is entitled, Restoring Our Storehouse. Now when you got it, say, I got it. Got it. All right, here we go. So the first nine verses of Nehemiah 13 reads, On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God, for they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now before this, Eliashib the priest was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and it was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering. The frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priest. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon I, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And I, I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry and threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders and they cleansed the chambers and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with a grain offering and the frankincense. The word of the Lord is blessed. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, right? So if you're joining us for the first time here in service or online, we are finishing and concluding our repair and restore series. We've been talking about God repairing and restoring things that are broken in our lives, and we've been going through the book of Nehemiah to do that. Now, if you don't know anything about Nehemiah, the book was written sometime around the 5th century BC, and it recounts the story of a Hebrew leader named Nehemiah. So Nehemiah is commissioned by the, uh, the Persian king, really he's commissioned by God, to go and rebuild the walls in Jerusalem. Now, the walls in Jerusalem were raised to the ground by the Babylonians because they came and sieged it. It was a big mess. So, you know, Nehemiah hears about this going on, and it would be like not having running water or electricity in your household. They did not have walls in the city. And so Nehemiah comes to lead a project to rebuild these city walls. Now, we've been going through these first 12 chapters of the book of Nehemiah the last few weeks, and we've been talking about all the obstacles that Nehemiah had to overcome, the people had to overcome to build this wall. And so they actually end up building the wall. It's, it's in record time. It's in 52 days that they complete this wall, but the book doesn't end when they finish the wall. The story goes on. The narrative continues. And so after Nehemiah completes the wall, he you know, he goes back to the king. He was the cupbearer, and he's, you know, chilling and, and whatnot. He's like, hey, maybe I, should, maybe I should check up on the boys. So he goes back, and, and he checks on everything that's happening in Jerusalem, and he finds that in the storehouse, in the temple of God, that one of God's enemies is residing there. It's a man named Tobiah. Now, if you haven't been with us, Tobiah is, he's kind of been a reoccurring theme 
within the book of Nehemiah. And so I have a few scriptures to kind of to, to show you the character of this guy throughout the book of Nehemiah. He's been there pretty much since the beginning. Nehemiah 2.10. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, great names for kids, uh, servant heard this, it pleased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So obviously Tobiah does not want the Israelites to succeed. Here's another one. Nehemiah 2.19. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Here's another one for you. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. I got one more for you today. Now, when Sambalat and Tobiah, the Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, basically the, the picture I'm trying to paint is that this guy was an enemy of God. He, he did not want Nehemiah's plan, God's plan, to come to fruition. And so this guy that has kind of been a thorn in Nehemiah's side for the entire narrative is not only in the city of Jerusalem, but he's in the temple. And he's in the storehouse. Now, what was the storehouse, right? The storehouse is where they kept the grain, the food, all the good stuff for the Levites living in the temple. Levites were people that were descended from the tribe of Levi that, you know, were um, basically in charge of the things of God in the temple, taking care of it, things like that. The people would tithe so that the Levites could, could live off of the things in the temple. And, and, and basically, they were in charge of the things of God. Now, in the temple... There, there were many rooms, but in this one particular room, it's kind of everything they needed to survive within the temple. And we find that the high priest, Eliashib, actually cleared out the storeroom and said, hey, Tobiah, come live in the holy place. And so we see this is a, a very big problem because earlier in, in Nehemiah uh, chapter 13, in the first few verses, it talks about how these people aren't even to be mingling with the Ammonites and the Moabites because these people want nothing to do with God and his people. They've actually cursed the people of God. So not only is he in the city of Jerusalem, but he's in the walls of the most holy place. And I know a lot of us are scratching our heads and we're going, how could you let that ha happen? How could you be that idiotic? Like that's absolutely insane. And I, I think before we point our fingers at the Israelites, we have to point inwardly. How have you let the enemy come into your storehouse? How have you let the enemy take charge of your temple? And so Nehemiah has a very, very interesting response. And I think that we can kind of learn a few things about how uh, Nehemiah responds today. So it brings me to my first point. Point number one, align your heart with God's heart. What does that look like? A few summers ago, I had the awesome opportunity and privilege to be a camp counselor uh, for special needs children in Texas. And they hired me on as their music director, and it was absolutely amazing. The kids were awesome. I got to see crazy things like uh, a deaf girl win musical chairs. I got to uh, see kids in wheelchairs take part in parades. I got to, you know, minister to kids that their entire lives they've been picked on. They've been singled out. They didn't feel like they belonged. And I got to hang out with these kids and make sure that they had the best best possible week of their lives. And I loved all of them. But there was one kid, and his name was Jeffrey with a G. Now, a few things about Jeffrey with a G. Jeffrey with a G was notorious for being the baddest kid at camp. Every year, we would kind of, the, the camp counselors would kind of be in anticipation of this and, and, and be like, oh, who's got Jeffrey with a G this year? Who's in, whose cabin is he in? Like, who, who's got Jeffrey with a G? And I had Jeffrey with a G in my cabin. Now, Jeffrey with a G was violent. He would punch kids all the time. I don't know why we didn't send him home. It wasn't my call. Uh, Jeffrey with a G would pick on kids. And Jeffrey with a G had a strange fixation on bugs, right? So he would pick up bugs and like show them to the counselors and look, man, I, I'm not afraid of anything. Come on, man. But when you put a beetle 
in my face. Like, how am I supposed to react, you know? Um, and so he, he was just kind of a terror to the kids and all the camp counselors. And, man, uh, by the end of the week, I was fed up with this kid. I'm like, we need to send this kid home. He keeps coming here year after year. I don't know why they allow him to do that. It doesn't make any sense. Send Jeffrey with a G home. And so I remember uh, I, I was teaching a music class, and I had a little bit of downtime. And one of my friends was um, in charge of the art room, and, and she was right next to me. So I thought I'd pop in there, and all the kids were kind of working on stuff, and they were just drawing all these awesome pictures, and the assignment basically was to just draw whatever you want. It was, it was the last day of the week. So Jeffrey with a G was in there, and he was scribbling away, and I was talking to the other counselors, and he looks at me, and his face kind of lights up, and I'm like, please don't be a beetle in your hand, like, <laughs> relax. And he kind of scampers up to me, and he goes, Mr. JC, Mr. JC, and I'm like, Yes, Jeffrey, if it's a bug, I'm sending you home, I swear. And, and he says, hey, I drew this picture for you. So I looked at the picture. The picture was trash, looked nothing like me. He tried to draw me. He, he got none of my distinguishing characteristics. It was not a good picture at all. Illustration was absolutely terrible. But, you know, I didn't tell the kid that. I'm like, this is incredible. And I'm looking at this picture, trying to figure out where my nose is, where my eyes are, things like that. He's about eight years old. And uh, there's this big squiggly line on my chest. I'm like, what is that, chest here? And so I ask him, I'm like, dude, what, like, what, is, what is this supposed to be? And he looks at me and goes, that's an S. And I'm like, why did you draw an S on my chest? And he says, because you're my hero. Jeffrey just wanted somebody to care about him. And I had completely written him off as a bad kid, as a bad egg, and I don't want to say that that uh, necessarily, um, that that's an excuse for his actions, but in my heart and in my mind, I wanted nothing at all to do with this kid. I did not care about him at all. And the basis upon all of his actions was that he just wanted somebody to pay attention to him. He just wanted somebody to care. And I know a lot of us today are like that in the room, and maybe you come from a broken background, maybe you're hurting today, maybe you've experienced great loss, and I've come here today to tell you that Jesus saves, that Jesus loves you, that he has a plan for your life, and that he always, always, always cares, friends. And I think it's so easy to care about people that we like, right? Like, I, I care about my dad. I care about my friends. I care about Pastor Rusin. I care about people who do me good. But what about people we don't like, right? And I think being a Christian, being a follower of God, stems from us loving and caring about God. And if we love and we care about God, we care about his word, and we care about the statues and commandments that he set before us. See, when Nehemiah sees Tobiah in the temple, he gets angry. He cares about the things of God. And we're going to talk here in a second about how that moves him into action. But I just want to talk a little bit today about our hearts and what we care about, right? Because I know we care about politics. I know we care about what's going on within our immediate circle. I know we care about what's going on on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or even TikTok. But hey, when did we stop caring about the things of God? See, Nehemiah cared about God and was moved by what was happening. He had a passion. He had a desire for the things of God. I mean, this was a guy who just came and, and built the wall. He had nothing to do with the temple, but he still cared. Leads me to my second point this morning. Align your actions with God's will. You see, Nehemiah doesn't take time to kind of mull over what he's about to do. He doesn't go, oh, I need to like pray about this. I need to consult people. He sees something that needs correcting and he corrects it. He moves into action. He's spurred by this desire and this passion and this love for God, and therefore it leads him to do something about it. And like, hey, man, I love the Green Bay Packers. 
but the Packers did not die for my sins. And, you know, we've been talking about in Rooted the, the past couple of weeks sharing our message and, and sharing our testimony and how much an, uh, anxiety we get behind things like that. And I was thinking this week, you know, you know who's not afraid to share their faith and their beliefs? Vegans. People with peanut allergies. You know what I mean? Like, you never ask them if they're vegans or if they have a peanut allergy, but like somehow you know if you get what I mean. And so uh, all of this is spurred out of this desire uh, of wanting to do good and, and caring about the things of God and, and aligning our heart with God, but also making sure our actions are aligned with God's word as well. If everyone in here was as passionate about God's word as vegans are about their diet, everyone in the world would be Christian. Nehemiah sprung into action and corrected the situation. He didn't sit on his desire. He didn't sit on what God was calling him to do. He let his actions speak. Last point today, align your vision with God's purpose. I was a super mischievous 11-year-old. Like, my dad's here today, and he'd tell you, yeah, Jay was always getting into something. He was kind of an agent of chaos. He was always causing or getting into some mayhem, especially around 11, and he was always picking on his sisters. And I, I might push back on that a little bit, and, and I might say, well, that was only because I got caught. And now, the biggest reason that I always got caught was in Jame Krupa, my baby sister. Now, when I was 11, I, I still have three sisters, but my older sister, she was out of the house. She's about 11 years older than me. And then I had two younger sisters, Maya, who was nine at the time, and I had a baby sister, and Jame, who was about seven at the time. And something you need to know about Njame is that she was a notorious tattletale. Like, no matter what I did, I knew my mother and father would hear about it because Njame saw it. And I'd go up to her and I'd be like, Jame, please, please don't tell on me whether I was, you know, not ta doing my chores or, you know, just talking crap behind my parents' back, doing something I wasn't supposed to. And she'd go, I must, Jay, I have to. It is my duty. I must do the right thing. She's a very dramatic seven-year-old. And so I remember I vowed, hey, I'm going to get her back one day. And so one day we were all hanging out of the house. My, my dad was at work. My mother traditionally worked third shift, so she was catching up on sleep. And so it's me and my two other little sisters, and we're just kind of hanging out in the living room and uh, watching TV, playing with our toys. And uh, I see my baby sister kind of get up from where she's playing and grab a box of crayons. I'm like, okay, where's this going? So she grabs her box of crayons, and then she kind of walks over to the living room wall. Now, I can hear every parent, parent's heart dropping in here, but I need you to know, as I was viewing this, I was ecstatic. Like, I was super excited. So she takes out these crayons, and she starts drawing on the wall. And I'm, like, jumping up and down. I'm, so, I'm overjoyed that this is happening because I know what she's doing is wrong, and I know exactly what is coming. So she's drawing away. She, it, it, maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 30 minutes goes by, and she's just doing her thing. And I just got this gleeful expression on the other side of the room. I'm like, go crazy, go stupid, draw that. She draws this enormous flower or dinosaur. Could have been either of them. She was seven, you know. And uh, after a while, I hear footsteps coming down the stairs. It's my mom. And so my mom kind of gets to the point where you can peer into our living room down the stairs, and she looks at my little sister drawing on the wall, and at the top of her lungs, she goes, what are you doing? My sister drops her crayon. She darts in the kitchen. My mom runs after her. She corners her in the kitchen. My sister goes through her legs. She makes an NFL combine cut, goes back into the living room. My mom goes back after her, finally catches her by the arm, and me and my little sister are running up the stairwell, and we're singing a song that I coined myself. It was called the whooping song. And it goes like this. <clears throat> it's whooping time, it's whooping time. Repeat. It's whooping time, it's whooping time. Great, I've been a poet my entire life. So my sister and I are singing this song on the stairwell, and, and my mom kind of looks up as she's yelling at my baby sister, and she locks eyes with me. And she says, you, come here. Now, 
11-year-old me is super confused because I have nothing to do with the situation. So I'm like nonchalantly coming down the stairs, and I'm like, yes, Mom? And she goes, did you see this happen? And I go, yes, Mom. It's kind of hard not to see it. I didn't say that, but like in, in my head I said that. And I'll never forget this. She said, you're responsible for your sister. This is just as much your fault as it is her fault. My baby sister and I both received a whooping that day while my little sister sang the whooping song from the stairwell. But it got me thinking about responsibility and it got me thinking about our purpose in regards to God's will. Now, what's our, our responsibility as Christians? Well, you might say my responsibility as a good Christian is to go to church once a week. It's to, if you're like a really good Christian, go to life group or connect group. Maybe go to an all-church serve day, be generous with my money. And those are all excellent things, and I don't want to discourage anyone from, from doing those things. But I think if we get caught up in the things and the actions that we're doing, that we're kind of missing the point. See, our responsibility as Christians is to reach out to the lost. See, Nehemiah restored the storehouse to its original purpose. That wasn't Nehemiah's job. You see, when, when Nehemiah was commissioned to come to the city, he was working on the walls of Jerusalem. And when he returns, it's for the walls, but he finds something else that's out of place. And he says, this cannot stand, this must be corrected. And how often as Christians do we compartmentalize and kind of say, well, you, you know, those aren't my crowd of people. That's not really my responsibility. I don't really know, know what to do in, in this situation. And I would say to you that if they're in your sphere of influence, if you can do good, then do it. Nehemiah wasn't a Levite. He wasn't a high priest. He was a guy that was really good at building walls. See, Nehemiah took God's will as an obligation and not a passive opportunity. I think a lot of times in the church we get wrapped up into this, this sort of uh, uh, American idea of what Christianity is. And, like, we do all these things that are good, like I mentioned before, going to church and, and, and you know, going to connect groups and, and an all-church serve day and all this awesome stuff. And we say that's what it means to be a Christian. Because if I do enough good things, then I get to heaven, right? But I'm here today to tell you that the point of being a Christian is not going to heaven. It's bringing heaven here. You know, when you read the Bible in the Genesis account, you, you read about this awesome image about the Garden of Eden and how good it was and, and how perfect it was. And we, we've been talking about it and rooted the past couple of weeks and just this awesome design that God had built for us. And we end up ruining it. But throughout the entire, entire biblical narrative, God is trying to restore the garden. Except the, it's, it's not a garden anymore. By the book of Revelation, it's a city. It's New Jerusalem. God has always been about restoring the lost, about repairing the broken. And as his followers, we have to be too. Just out of Nehemiah's reaction, he got angry, he cared about the things of God. He took action right away. And then he made sure that he cleared out everything in the storehouse so that Tobiah could not return to the temple. He restored God's will in that place. And I wish I could tell you that, you know, the, the book ends there and it's like kind of a fairy tale ending. But throughout the book, the, the rest of the chapter, it kind of chronicles how Israel fell into sin and, and how they fell away and how all this beautiful uh, reading of the word and the dedication of the wall was something that only lasted a moment. 
I think what God is saying to us today is that he doesn't want this to just be a moment. He wants to restore our storehouse. And I think some of that is our responsibility. There's a saying that if there are a thousand steps to take, God will take 999 of them and leave the last one up to us. See, the book of Nehemiah was never about building a wall. It was about God building a bridge between him and his people. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for all things. We thank you that you are restoring us, God. We thank you for loving us while we were yet sinners, Jesus. Thank you for being a part of our lives. Thank you for chasing us down, God. For leaving the 99 to chase the one, Jesus. God, restore us. Restore our storehouse, God. Lord, help us, help us to care about the things that you care about, God. Break our hearts for the things that break yours, God. Repair and restore us, Jesus. We love you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name.